Today to talk about all things menopause. We cover the clinician and medical side, lifestyle, mental health. I'm Melanie Olson, the community director here at GenEv, and we today are going to kick off Diabetes Awareness Month by talking about blood sugar and menopause. The intersections of blood sugar, prediabetes, and insulin health and menopause are really vast. We have Dr. Yashika Dooley and Monica Jacobson, one of our talented registered dietitians and health coaches here, to share their collect collective wisdom and expertise with us about menopause, women at this stage of life, blood sugar, the physiological side of it, and also the important lifestyle side that, that we have to lean into and ma to manage our insulin health and hopefully to avoid type 2 diabetes. This discussion also intersects with other symptoms and changes that happens during this time of life. So we have a lot to talk about. It's definitely time for us in our midlife to double down on our health and how we manage our lifestyle. So let's get into it. I want to share a little bit about our guests. Um, Dr. Yashika Dooley is a Harvard-trained OBGYN fellowship-trained surgeon and a women's health menopause expert. Her mission is to help women advocate for themselves and their health through the perimenopausal and menopausal period. As a wife and mom, she understands the critical role women play in the lives of their family and communities. Isn't that the truth? And she believes in whole body health that optimizes a woman's quality of life. We also have Monica. I'll share a little on Monica too, because they're just both so amazing. Monica is a talented and accomplished registered dietitian and health coach with over 15 years experience coaching women on their health and wellness journeys. She helps women thrive in menopause and offers supports and accountability to her patients with an individualized approach. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks Thank you, Mel. Yeah, totally, totally. So kicking this off, um, Dr. Dooley, could you start us off by defining pre-diabetes, insulin resistance, and how that, what's going on in the body during that physiologically? So pre-diabetes is just when you start having elevated blood sugars and there are signs that your body is not responding to the insulin that you are naturally producing. So the idea would be that your, when your blood sugars start raising over time, we just get more concerned because it puts you at increased risk for uh, cardiovascular health. Uh, cardiovascular health, um, And I always tell women, it's not anything necessarily that you did wrong. It's like a little bit of the chicken or the egg. So there definitely are some genetics that are at play that could put you at increased risk for um, diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, but also as you become perimenopausal and postmenopausal, um, you know, having a more sedentary lifestyle. So you're not exercising and moving as much, increased stress, you're not sleeping as well. Um, all of those things as well um, can just put you at increased risk. A lot of times you're putting on weight, um, decreased muscle mass. And so there is an increased likelihood that you are gonna be at increased risk to get pre-diabetic, right? Or your blood sugars are increasing, which then could lead to you actually having the diagnosis of type two diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. And Monica, you know, you had mentioned some stats earlier about you know, and, and I'd love to hear, we'd love to hear a little more from your perspective on this too, around prediabetes from the lifestyle and, and the RDN side. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I've heard lots of different numbers on there and I had to do some fact checking of some of, some of those specific pieces of data myself. Um, and so according to the NHANES study in 2021, it's estimated that about 40% of adults in this country are insulin resistant. So they're on the path to developing prediabetes, diabetes. So we start to see insulin rising, um, in response to the blood sugars rising. And then when that relationship between insulin and glucose stops working as so well, that's how we develop diabetes. So, I mean, 40% is, that's nearly half and that's probably underreported because that's people mm -hmm. who've actually seen the doctor, they've had their blood work checked. Um, and 
unfortunately, a lot of people aren't doing that for lots of different reasons. So um, it's it's probably very much underreported in, in this country. Yeah. Um, mm. I was also thinking about this this morning a bit, just in the spirit of Diabetes Awareness Month. Um, and just like the type 2 diabetes was not a thing back in, not back hundreds of years ago. Um, it's truly like our modern world and our lifestyle that's, um, that's allowed it to be such a prevalent disease. And I mean, it was always there, but um, we didn't have the excessive amount of food and the sedentary lifestyle and the high levels of chronic stress and some of those other factors that are playing in. So um, diabetes and diseases of the pancreas have been around those endocrine disorders, but not, um, it's just, it, I thought that was just kind of interesting to reflect on a little bit how we, we got here because of our, our lifestyle. That's so incredibly interesting. And, and I didn't know that. And it, of course, it makes sense. Of course, we live in this world. And this is privilege in a crazy way that's killing us. But we are living in this abundance and, and in this place where we have all this access to these foods and lifestyles that that aren't aren't necessarily serving us, as you're saying. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Um, you know, what I think is really encouraging, though, is that when if you know that you're developing insulin resistance and you're or maybe you even have been told you're pre-diabetic um, from mm -hmm. from a doctor or health practitioner, um, that to me is like putting like a present in your hand. You have information that you can do something about and you have so much power to mitigate that, reduce that risk and reverse it. And I've seen it done hundreds of times through mm. people I've worked with in my career. Um, so I'm saying that if you have been told you're pre-diabetic, if you don't change your lifestyle, you're most likely going to develop type two diabetes. You're on, on that trajectory. Um, and the reverse of that is true that you have so much power to, to attack that from a lifestyle perspective, um, even without any medication to get your body, um, on the opposite trajectory back toward, mm -hmm. um, healthy glycemic, um, control. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too, Dr. Dooley, because I think we've all seen that so much in practice. Oh, totally. I tell people, I'm like, it's just like a warning sign, right? You're like mm -hmm. coming up to the traffic signal. It's just a warning sign. It doesn't mean that anything bad has happened yet, but it's like, hey, your body's just letting you know whatever you're eating, whatever you're doing or not doing is just not working well for you. And everybody's different. So people will be like, but my girlfriend did this or my sister did it. I'm like, yeah, I totally get it. But for you, it doesn't work. So you mm -hmm. need to be active. You need to watch what you're eating and like, you know, hidden sugars. Because people are like, well, I eat really healthy, you know. And sometimes it's just like, are there lots of hidden sugars? Or are you drinking lots of sugary calories? Like, you know, the frappuccinos mm -hmm. and the things that I too love, right? But you just sometimes are not aware of how we are taking in more calories, especially really sugary calories. Um, mm -hmm. And we're working really hard, but we're sitting down all day working at our desk. We're not moving around as much. It's those little bitty things that completely change our body profile. And it just puts at, us at increased risk and we're not even aware. I'm like, so this is just our body saying, hey, wake up. I just want to let you know what's yeah. going on. If you keep doing these yeah. things, this is the next thing that's going to happen. But at the same time, your body's like, hey, move a little bit more, yeah. you know, a little bit of strength training, a little change in maybe what you're eating and you will absolutely go the other way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, as I said, I've seen this lots and lots and lots of times with patients that I've worked mm -hmm. with and it doesn't mean you need to lose, you know, 50 pounds or you need to drastically change or never eat any sugar or go to like some crazy restrictive um, way of eating. It's actually about building consistent 
behaviors that are really sustainable. And the cool thing about all of this from a nutrition perspective is if any, any, pe any of the people going through um, Genev that come to work with us um, who want to learn about nutrition, we talk about our menopause healthy plate, which is almost exactly like the diabetes healthy plate method. It's, it's very similar. And what I mean by that is it's including all of your macronutrients, your protein, your fat, and your carbohydrates, but making sure you're getting the right balance of those nutrients at every meal and every snack as much as possible, you know, with the caveat that we live our lives. And of course, we're going to, every day won't be perfect, but the more meals that can be in that balance, the more we're setting ourselves up to have better blood sugar control and to have that insulin work how it's supposed to in the body. So um, I totally agree with you. It's, it's little changes that, that we can make that, um, that are actually those that we can stick with that make the biggest difference. I love that. I love the menopause plate. And uh, we have another broadcast on the menopause plate. And, yes. uh, you know, will you share what that just high level, what is it? And I will tell you that I've been trying to, you know, I'm, I'm doing the visual of it is so critically helpful. Um, if you don't mind just sharing yeah. the, the menopause plate. Yeah, it's so simple. And I think that's um, the cool thing about the plate is that, yes, it's great for women and people born with ovaries who are in menopause, but it's really great for just about everyone and pre-diabetics included, diabetics included. Um, it's, it's going to um, fill. So if we think about your plate, like a big circle of a plate um, in the menopause, healthy plate, about half your plate would come from fiber rich um, vegetables. So these are like the non-starchy veggies. So pretty much everything besides maybe potatoes and corn or maybe some like winter squash, but really almost all vegetables fit into that side of your plate. And I will say you can't overdo the vegetables. So don't let anyone tell you, you you're eating too many carrots. That's going <laughs> to spike your blood sugar. Just eat the dang carrots all as well. Eat the vegetables. Um, okay. So quarter, sorry, half your plate veggies. And then a quarter of your plate is some kind of lean protein. And that can be plant-based protein or lean animal protein, like um, poultry, fish, um, more protein-rich dairy, like Greek yogurt, cheese, um, beans, lentils, tofu, those types of foods. And then that last quarter of your plate is for um, carbohydrates. And this, these are the fiber-rich carbohydrates. So these are the ones that are not going to spike your blood sugar as high. So think things like fruit, especially with skin or seeds in there, um, whole grains, um, the more starchy vegetables, like that's where the potatoes would fit. Um, and, you know, also if you do include like a sweet treat or you do have the frappuccino or something that has a little bit or, or a lot more sugar, we teach that that's where that fits. That fits into the carb section of your plate model. And while a piece of fruit might be a healthier, more nutritious choice than the Frappuccino, both can serve a purpose and a time and a place in mm -hmm. the greater scheme of things. So um, that's the menopause healthy plate. Um, I also forgot to mention um, right in the center of the plate, we leave space for a little bit of healthy fat because that's also really good for your heart health, um, for your satiety. So you feel more full and, um, by eating fat, you don't get fat. Eating fat is good for you. So I think we all probably know that by now, but it's so good to reiterate that you need protein, you need healthy fats and you need fiber rich carbohydrates. All of that works together to balance blood sugars. Oh, that's so awesome. And yeah, and super universal as we, you know, when, when I, we're in the community every day, there's over 8,000 women and, and people with ovaries in there talking about their experience uh, with menopause and, and much of this type of diet helps with just other parts of menopause, you know, keeping us a little bit less inflamed or a little let that less uh, stiff, which we're dealing with, you know, and, and so, yeah, it, it is quite universal and 
I've been trying to tell my teenagers, you know, I'm just trying to just trying to tell them, you know, just look at your plate. Half of it should be vegetables. We're we're working on that, you know, but it, it's yeah. easy. You can just kind of aspire to. Yeah, absolutely. It it takes some practice and yeah. um, but it's in my experience and I think any nutrition professional would agree that um, finding a sustainable way to eat is going to be the best thing for your health in the long term versus something that feels too restrictive or too hard to really do in the longer term. So um, again, just the beauty of, of that balance. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Dooley, you had talked a little bit about the stuff that goes on in midlife and how it intersects and, and, you know, it's like a loss of sleep. It can kind of all come together at this time. Um, and, and then you also said, I think both of you about how that intersects with cardiovascular health and, and women's health in general. Can you talk a little bit about how that all relates? Well, we just know that women are going to be at increased risk for, um, high cholesterol. And when that occurs, and some of it's going to be genetic. So I always tell people, there's lots of things that happen that are genetic and everything is not something that you did wrong, right? Yeah. So don't feel like I didn't do it right. It's all my fault. Not that at all, but some of it's genetic. And so you're going to be just at increased risk just because. Um, and then some of it is just as you go through life, you're hitting that perimenopausal period, your body is changing. Um, mm -hmm. For lots of us, myself included, I am not as active. And when I am, what I am doing is running around after my kids, not <laughs> running on the track or running miles, right? And so it just, it's different. And so we just have to realize that when you have less lean body mass, when you're not moving and getting that cardiovascular exercise, um, your heart just, is going to be at increased risk, right? And so one of the big killers of women is cardiovascular disease and heart attacks. And so these are all the things that we're going to be looking at. And again, the great thing is that you can prevent that if you're on top of it, if you're just being aware. And it doesn't take a lot of major lifestyle changes. It's what are the little things, little tweaks that you can do throughout your week or throughout your day, and even trying to incorporate your family if you've got to, right? Just to make mm -hmm. it sustainable, to make it fun, and to make it things that you know you can continue to do. Yeah. Listener, if you have any questions, please put them in chat. We're going to be putting some resources in chat too, some good articles to read about this. Um, just hoping to, to, to give you all that you can uh, to, to be a um, more ready to handle this time of life. And if, and if you're handling or dealing with this yourself or know someone that you love that's dealing with it, it's likely that you are. Um, I think there's a lot of shame and embarrassment about it, you know, especially from the diet culture uh, where we as women need to, or, and men, everyone, we all need to look a certain way. And some of those things don't work well in this consistency world that we're trying to create of good diet and nutrition. That just wasn't presented to us, some of us, you know, and so let's just be real and kind with each other, but we do need to lean into this if we want this, this health, right? Yeah, definitely. And I always tell people, what is it that you like? What is it that you enjoy that it's going to make it easy, right? So even like with vegetables, right? Like I do not like steamed vegetables and a lot of people don't, right? I'm like, so don't eat canned, mushy, steamed vegetables if that's not what you like, but venture out. Do you like roasted vegetables? What are the things that you can do that you look forward to eating, right? And so for my kids, one of the things I say is I make a range of vegetables. I won't just make broccoli because some, my son likes broccoli, my daughter, not so much. So like I will do like a little bit of broccoli and some cauliflower and like roasted Brussels sprouts, and then they can pick out of that what they like. It's like giving variety and making it in a way that people want to eat it, or even like fresh veggies cut up. I always offer fresh veggies on the table. I find the more that it makes it easy and it's like there to like snack on, my kids will like go for it. Um, mm -hmm. I am in Texas, so we love avocados. Like, and, you know, it's like, so what are those things that you love to eat that I don't feel like it's a burden and neither do my kids. If, if there are avocados in our house, my kids will be eating avocados and making guacamole, right? It's something that I was never even exposed to as a child though. So it's like, how do you just kind of venture out from the things that you're like, ooh, I hate vegetables. Well, maybe there are other vegetables that you can try and maybe there's new ways to incorporate them that then you really want them. You're like almost craving them and that yeah. is the thing, right? Same thing for exercise. 
if you hate certain things, like what is an exercise or what is something that you love? Do you like yoga or do you like spinning or do you like, you know, walking with friends or running or like, it's like finding those things that you would enjoy that doesn't feel like exercise. You're like, I would do this because I just enjoy doing it anyway. Um, and I would choose to do this because I feel so good after I do it. It gives me that natural endorphin high. Mm -hmm. and I feel so much better in my body. So yeah. true. Yeah. It doesn't have to look the way that you may think is what you're saying. And I just love that. It's so empowering to remember that. It could be a 10 minute walk instead of an hour long walk or yes. two or three mm -hmm. 10 minute walks or, yeah. you know, something I read recently is it really makes a difference after you have a meal. And I actually love to take a little walk. That's something I like to do. Yeah. So taking a 10 minute after meal walk or just even I'll sometimes do this because I am insulin resistant and I am pre-diabetic and I'm working on this. And, and so I know all of us can do it, but it's just little things and it's making a difference. Mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. awesome, Melanie. Yeah. And, you know, I think um, it can be really scary to get a diagnosis of pre-diabetes or to hear that you're insulin resistant. Um, and I think sometimes people feel really overwhelmed with that and feel like, well, I don't even know where to begin. I don't, I hate exercise. I hate veggies. I don't know what to do. And I'm totally just making that scenario up. I think um, it, it doesn't discriminate. You can like to move or not like to move and feel how you feel about food and nutrition, but truly um, it can be so scary and really overwhelming. Um, but starting somewhere is, is the key. And that's where we help we help our patients with that because they, they may come to us and say, Oh, I just got my blood work back recently. And I've been told I'm pre-diabetic. I've heard I should follow this diet, or I've heard I should do this kind of exercise. Mm -hmm. And it's so scary and confusing too. And so a lot of what we do is, well, let's just debunk some of those myths or let's talk through like what's really going to be um, low hanging fruit. What can you actually mm -hmm. start doing today? That's going to move the dial and, start moving things in the right direction. So we're really key about meeting our patients where they're at. Um, and I also just add that if you are a person who has a family history of diabetes, um, or if you had gestational diabetes um, earlier in life before any stage of menopause, you're definitely at an increased risk um, for developing type two. So um, I've seen people in their thirties, easily like early thirties develop insulin resistance and type, uh, and prediabetes. So, um, it's not something that hits well into midlife either. It can be in earlier years. And I think like, because lifestyle and genetics play such a huge role, just good to like, look under the hood, see what's actually happening there with yeah. both your family history and your genetics as well as um, those actual numbers in your blood work. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up a really important point, those tests and how, you know, and, and that get massive gap we were talking about, about people being aware of this insulin resistance or this path that they're on, that they're on, they may not be aware. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what, what's available and what people do to get tested? Yeah, Dr. Julie, do you want to speak to that? Since um, as a doctor, you guys are the ones ordering the labs and making that actually happen. Yeah, I, I would say most people are going to easily be able to get like either a fasting blood sugar or like with your routine labs. I know oftentimes I have people come in and be like, can I check my hemoglobin A1C? Mm -hmm. um, and that is for most people harder to get it because it is not a screening test and a lot of insurance carriers won't automatically cover it. Um, but I will say just with the fasting blood sugar, we get a lot of information and we can already tell like if you're heading in that direction. And I will just tell people if you are, if we look at your BMI or if you know that you have put on a significant amount of weight, especially in a short period of time, um, there is no number necessarily that I say that's when we start it. Like, right, there is never a bad time to like start incorporating these lifestyle changes. And even more so if we notice that your fasting blood sugar is starting to slowly creep up and rise. Yeah, that's wow. so true because there's so many other reasons to um, 
healthy eating and that balance and moving your body and outside of just yeah. glycemic health. So I totally second that. Yeah. yeah. And that's interesting about insurance, not covering it. Um, you know, I just haven't had that experience because I've always been a little overweight and, you know, I just feel like I've had that, that license, but I've, I've talked to a good friend recently who, who, you know, she's, she's a dietitian and, and any, anyway, she just said, yeah, there is a pretty big gap there. They don't cover if there's not these other indicators. And that, that seemed a little, um, I don't know, that's a, a little disheartening considering where we're going, where we're all kind of going as a culture, you know, um, and we want to yeah. stop it. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty yeah. common. I mean, if you come in and there are other risk factors, so if you have increased cholesterol or if you have concerns that your doctor has for your heart, or if you're already showing elevated fasting blood sugars, then they will pull those other labs. They will pull a hemoglobin mm -hmm. C or they'll start looking for your insulin numbers, but those are just not the first numbers that they look for. And so that's why I always tell people like, you know, the doctor's going to look at the whole picture. We don't automatically just order labs randomly. So oftentimes your doctor has been talking with you. They're looking at your blood pressure. They're looking at your trend in your weight. Um, they're listening to what you are telling them and also looking at whatever you're saying as far as your family history. And like Monica, mm -hmm. like, were you, um, did you have gestational diabetes when you had pregnancies earlier? Like all of those factors are taken into account when we're saying, okay, do what labs do we need to order? What's going to be appropriate? And just making sure that it's also going to be um, relevant for you. Mm -hmm. And where does exercise go into this? I mean, is this is like, what's the most important thing that we should do? Should we just shore up that nutrition? Or is it just the whole package? I'd argue it's the whole package. I mean, I yeah. think yeah, then you're you're taking it, you're taking a multi-prong approach to your overall health and wellness. And um, and exercise may help support weight loss if weight loss is also a goal or something that you want to be working on. Um, it can certainly help with that um, insulin response in the body. Um, when we have more muscle mass, we have more highly metabolic tissue and that can increase metabolism. Um, many other reasons to exercise mm -hmm. too, yeah. but yeah, I definitely say it's, it's diet, it's nutrition. Um, I'd also throw in their stress. I definitely would say um, even emotional stress. There's good research that that will increase um, blood sugar levels. Um, I've seen people uh, come to me, especially after maybe a stressful season. Like I've worked with people here at Genev who lost family members during the pandemic and then um, were depressed and had and then menopause. And it was sort of this like perfect mm -hmm. storm of all this crazy stuff, big life stuff happening. And that led to eating habits falling off the radar mm -hmm. a little bit or less movement, or even if that stuff stayed hunky dory, even some of that stress just caused an elevation in um, average blood sugar numbers. And so um, it's sensitive and um so I think it's just good to be thinking about like all those different factors that are influencing our, our blood sugar, our glycemic health. Um, and it just kind of comes back to like that whole person wellness, which we're always trying to think about here. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Um, I'm putting some, some great articles in chat uh, so everyone can read these, but you can always get to us by going to genev.com and go to our learn section. It's full of articles. It's full of good information. Um, and, 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 but I'd love, you know, we're putting a few great resources specifically that intersect with this topic. Um, what else, anything else to one last little thing? What, what, what's the, what's the one thing that we want to share with our audience before we leave today? How about we can do this? You, you know? can do it. Do this. <laughs> yes. You can actually, and I tell people, and you can do it even as we go into the holidays, because people are like, oh my God, it's going to be Thanksgiving. And this is the time when all the great food, they were like, this is the worst. And I'm like, you can still do it, right? You, It's it's totally doable. You can enjoy all of the Thanksgiving feast and the Christmas and all of that. But it's like also about moderation, right? It's like enjoying that, but still moving and still making sure that majority of what you're eating is still following that healthy plate. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sure. What were you going to say, Monica? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, 
I think that's such a good point around the holidays. And I think sometimes people kind of table their health until January. I just got to get through the holidays and then I'm going to refocus. And um, that's an approach. But honestly, like the holiday season is a season. But if you think about the holidays themselves, there's three or four holidays at the most where even if you just enjoy the heck out of it, eat and drink all the things that you really want, even if it's done in total excess, three or four days of that, you'll be okay. Um, I don't think that's going to kick anyone into diabetes by just a few days of eating all the Christmas cookies. Um, however, if it turns into on the daily that's happening, yeah, that might be another story by January. So yeah. um, again, back to that idea of moderation and um, truly, I think like knowledge is power with this, <clears throat> knowing your numbers, knowing where your blood work is, um, reflecting a little bit on your, your family history. Um, that stuff's really, really powerful. And I think, um, really there's, we've seen it so many times where effort toward a, a healthier lifestyle can really kick that, um, pre-diabetes into the other direction and really reverse it. So, um, and that's through no medicine, like just yeah. doing the, all the things um, that really contribute to your overall health. So yeah. that would be my biggest takeaway is just to arm yourself with the knowledge and really get a pulse of where you're at. And then no matter where that is, know that you can reverse that. You can change that. Yeah. And I love, and we're here to help. Yes, we're here to help. And I love one more thing I'm going to say that helps me. And that is, does this serve me? Because I have, you know, and, and, and coming to the table, figuratively and really truly over the holidays, but you know, is this going to serve me? And I'm, and, and will I enjoy this as much as I think I will? And actually that helps. It's a, it's a tactic I've been doing that helps me to, to be more conscious and more like aware of my decision-making around it. But we can talk about this so much everyone. Um, and we will, uh, but I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you to Dr. Dooley. Uh, and thank you to Monica. Uh, you're both so awesome and, and a total wealth of knowledge. I so appreciate you spending your time with us this afternoon. Community and listeners, FYI, you can schedule an appointment with, with either one of them if you would like to work with either one of them. Um, our doctors and RDNs work together to bring comprehensive menopausal care and health care to our patients. Uh, next up on Wednesday, November 8th, we'll be continuing on this path by going live on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube again with Stacey Kassentruck, our Gen Ev Director of Lifestyle Care. Um, we are going to tackle a registered, uh, registered dietitian and health coach she is and talk about the metabolic exercise side of it. She, uh, an insulin resistance and menopause. Stacy is an exercise and insulin resistant expert and is a wealth of knowledge. You are not gonna wanna miss it. So we're gonna keep talking about this. Um, and all one last thing, I'm here to remind you, you don't have to suffer or, or even have menopause. We don't even su suffer in menopause. We just, we don't always suffer in menopause, but you're not alone. There's a fantastic Facebook community called Menopause Solutions by Gen Ev with over 8,300 members discussing their experiences, comparing stories. They're truly seeing each other every day and we're moderating it along with the docs and the RDNs to bring accurate information to the forefront. There are real medical treatments and lifestyle treatments and great expertise and knowledge for us to all tap into. Go to www.genev.com for those resources and education. Take our menopause assessment to get started and or, or book your appointment today. You usually can turn that around within three to five days. It's worth investing in yourself and in your quality of life. Okay, we'll see you all next time. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye everyone.